Laban had a servant for 20 years. Jacob served Laban. He served faithfully. And even though Jacob served faithfully for those 20 years, Laban continued to be unjust. And as Jacob left, Laban pursued after Jacob, accused him of acting foolishly, and accused him of stealing Laban's household gods. And Jacob had had enough, and he went off. He became angry. The, the word angry is, is furious. It's more than just he was, he was upset or, or even he was, think of the harshest word that you can think of for being upset, and that's what Jacob was. He was done. He wasn't just frustrated. He wasn't just upset. These 20 years of, of mistreatment have built up in him. And now we've all experienced this, haven't we? It's one of the things I love about Scripture is it's honest about people. It doesn't sugarcoat. They're not painted with rose-colored glasses. They are real. They experience the things that we experience. They do the things that we do. They go through the emotions that we go through. Remember, as you read Scripture, these are real people. They're not just some story. This really happened. And all of us, in one way or another, can empathize with Jacob, can't we? Right? We've all been mistreated. We've all experienced whether it was a, a boss or a person in school or whoever it was, we've all felt mistreated. We've all been mistreated, although none of us probably to the extent that Jacob was. And so we can understand why Jacob went off. But as Christians, we're called to be different. Or Proverbs 15.1 reminds us that a soft answer turns away wrath. But a harsh word stirs up anger. We, we experience this in our own lives. As, as we respond harshly, harsh words are given back. And it escalates quickly. But a soft word turns away wrath. We, we know this, right? But, but sometimes... Sometimes it just feels good in the moment to lash out. Sometimes we feel like, you know what, I just, I feel better after I do this. And yet we also know that we're not supposed to. It doesn't make it right. James 1, 19 and 20 says, Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, Slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Know this. Be slow to anger. Be quick to listen. Oftentimes, in arguments or in discussions, we're, we're listening not so we can understand. We're listening so we can attack. We're listening for, for the weakness. We're listening for something to pounce on. Colossians, Paul wrote, to put away anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk, and to let our speech always be gracious. And so as we read Jacob and we understand what he's doing and we understand why and we can sympathize with him, it doesn't make it right. As we read Scripture, Read it as human beings. Read it as examples. And look at what Scripture says about those activities. God is gracious. God uses Jacob. And he uses this moment between Jacob and Laban to set up, to fulfill his promise. But we're not supposed to respond this way. Why? How? How could Jacob respond any other way? See, we, we know the one who has the real reason to be angry. Right? When we think of what misdeeds have been done to us, remember who God is and the misdeeds that we have done to him. 
There is nothing that anyone has done to you that is worse than what you have done to God. And yet, the one who has the most reason to be angry sent his son to pay the penalty for our sins against him. The one we have offended the most became a man so that he could suffer and die in our place for those very things that we did against him so that we could be reunited with him. So we can forgive and not lash out because of what God has done for us. In addition to this, we know that God will right all wrongs. He will bring justice to all injustices. All sins against us are actually sins against God, and he will deal with those. With the, with the fellow Christian, we know that that Jesus paid for those very things that make us angry. And for the non-Christians, know that your actions, your response is a witness. Is a witness to them on what you put your hope in. Back to Jacob, he became angry with Laban and berated him. Verse 36, what is my sin that you have hotly pursued me, that the hotly pursued is, is hunted down. Why are you treating me like a wild animal that you are hunting down? After Laban searched through all of Jacob's stuff to find these household gods that he couldn't find, Jacob demanded that Laban lay out everything that he had. Laban, take everything that you found that is yours and lay it out for all to see. A little bit of humility here on, for Laban, don't you think? He accused Jacob of stealing things. He hotly pursued him. He hunted him down and he found nothing. Jacob is demanding justice. He's demanding that Laban admit that he is wrong. See, this is how disputes were settled back then. The, the kinsmen of Jacob and the kinsmen of Laban would act almost as jurors. And they would say who is right and who is wrong. And there is ample evidence here that Jacob is in the right, that Laban is in the wrong. Jacob knew that Laban had nothing to back up his claims. Although remember... Rachel actually did steal the household gods, but Jacob was unaware of it at the time. So Jacob exposed Laban as the one who could not be trusted. And something that we'll see throughout this passage is a division in the families is now here. What, what was one family unit, the, the family of Terah. Remember, Terah had two sons, Abraham and Nahor, and Rebekah and Rachel and Leah came from Nahor's side. And so they were, they were still one family unit. But there's a division that is, that is starting to be seen. And Jacob says, lay it before my kinsmen and your kinsmen. We are not the same. There is a division now. Jacob had his family, Laban had his. And no longer were Rachel and Leah in Laban's family, they were in Jacob's. Remember God's promise that he would make Abraham into a great nation, that he would separate Abraham's family from the rest of the world, that they would be the, the nation that God had chosen. And God is now fulfilling that promise as the family of Terah is divided. Jacob made sure that everybody there knew that Laban's accusations were blameless. Laban had played the victim. He had accused Jacob, but Jacob was the victim and not Laban. And if that wasn't enough, Jacob then goes through the 20 years that he had been with him. Jacob's record speaks for itself. He doesn't need to defend his actions. He doesn't need to defend what he did because everything that he did was right. 
he took care of Laban's flock. No matter how Laban mistreated Jacob, Jacob served faithfully. His livestock had not miscarried. In 20 years, Jacob was a good shepherd. He knew what he was doing, and he worked, and he took care of the flock. And not only did Jacob work hard, but God was gracious. And in 20 years, there was not one miscarriage. Laban's flock benefited greatly from Jacob. And Laban knew this. Remember, before they entered into the second agreement, Laban said, I know that God has blessed you and your work, and I have benefited from it. Laban had no question that Jacob was the reason why Laban's wealth had increased. But not only did nothing miscarry, Jacob didn't eat any of Laban's animals. And that is something that he would have been allowed to do. The the hired shepherd was allowed to feed himself from the flock that he was taking care of. And Jacob did not do that. Not only that, if a livestock happened, if a livestock died, if something happened, Jacob replaced it. Again, this is contrary to law. You read the Code of Hammurabi, which is at the same time as this is taking place. If a shepherd brought the remains of an animal killed by wild animals or struck by lightning to the owner, the shepherd was not held responsible. So Jacob, if if a lion came and took a sheep or a goat, Jacob could have taken the remains and brought it to Laban and said, I'm laying it before you. I am not responsible. That was his right. But Laban held Jacob responsible. And Jacob says, by day or by night. And it's a way of saying, whether I was on watch or if it was one of your other shepherds, you held me responsible. I, it had to come out of mine. Jacob didn't have to bear the brunt of the losses, but he did. And so Laban never suffered loss while Jacob was the shepherd. Jacob was out in the elements, the heat of the day, the cold of night. He worked hard and had many sleepless nights. This was not an easy job. Jacob was a hard worker and he served faithfully. For 20 years. And in spite of his faithfulness, Laban was unfaithful. Jacob had worked 14 years to marry Laban's two daughters. Remember the the agreement was he would work seven years for Rachel. But then Laban deceived Jacob. And so Jacob worked 14 years. Laban had changed Jacob's wages ten times after they had an agreement on wages. And Jacob here was certain that if God had not intervened, Laban would have taken everything away from Jacob. And he would have returned home with nothing. Look at verse 42. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been on my side... Surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God saw my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. Jacob gives God credit for protecting him. In spite of all, is that, is that something you can do where you look at all the difficult situations that you're experiencing and say, God, you are faithful. In spite of all that has happened, God, you have been faithful. And if so often I'll look at my situation and say, God, where are you? God, what are you doing? God, why are you allowing this? And instead, Jacob said, God was faithful. Had God not appeared to Laban, this meeting would have been very different. But notice there's a name of God here that appears only in this section in Scripture. 
And that name is the fear of Isaac. The the way that you could translate that is the one of Isaac who causes others to fear. The, The God of Isaac who causes others to fear. Laban, the, God, the fear of Isaac is what is preventing you from doing me harm. It's an appropriate name, don't you think? Because it is actually the fear of the God of Isaac that is keeping Laban from doing what he intended to do. But also see again that he is the God who sees. God causes fear, yes, but he is also the God who sees. Remember in in Genesis 16, 13, Hagar said, you are a God of seeing. God saw Jacob's affliction and he rebuked Laban. And it shows that Laban and not Jacob was in the wrong. Now, As is typical for Laban, after Jacob lets him have it, Laban responded. And it is such a ridiculous response. Verse 43, the daughters are my daughters, the children are my children, the flocks are my flocks, and all that you see is mine. But what can I do this day for these my daughters or for the children whom they have borne? What can I do this day? Laban took credit and claimed ownership of all that Jacob had. Jacob just went through this whole thing. These 20 years, Laban, you have been blessed because God has blessed you because of me. Look at all the hard work I gave you. And Laban looked at that and says, everything you have is mine. Your daughters are mine. Your your, Your children are my grandchildren. You have nothing, Jacob. It's all mine. This brings credibility to Jacob's statement that if God had not rebuked Laban, that this act, this meeting would have been very different. Laban claimed that he was the reason that Jacob had wealth and a family. He believed that Jacob owed him. He believed that Jacob owned him, owed him. What foolishness and what blindness. Even though he knew God blessed him because of Jacob, Laban was not willing to admit that he benefited. Instead, he claims ownership of everything. And now Laban's daughters and grandchildren were leaving him. And this is why Laban says, but what can I do this day for these my daughters Or for their children whom they have born. Jacob, everything you have is mine. But what can I do? See, if God had not intervened, Laban would have had a very different response. He's not willing to admit that he benefited because of Jacob. See, this this, this was no longer a beneficial relationship. And so Laban is now turning his perspective Six years ago, it was, Jacob, I want you to stay because everything I have is because God has blessed you, has blessed me because of you. And now that Jacob is leaving, Laban no longer wants to admit that. His daughters and his grandkids were leaving him, and he couldn't stop them. Jacob's God had prevented Laban from interfering And so now Laban believed that Jacob had turned his daughters and his grandchildren away from him. Laban's inability to see his own part in any of this is truly astounding. He knew his claim. He knew that none of it was true. Not only did he know that, but God made it clear. And so now Laban proposes a covenant with Jacob. Again, he's trying to make himself look better in the eyes of those who are around him. He could do nothing to stop Jacob. He had no power. He had no authority. He was no longer in charge of anything. God had told him, don't you dare do a thing to Jacob. 
And so now Laban says, hey, why, why don't we enter into a covenant? Jacob, I am gonna, going to extend this wonderful invitation to you. I would like a covenant with you. It is completely self-serving. But this section, as we go through this covenant, really shows the division of the two families. There are now two people groups, the Hebrews and the Arameans. Remember, again, the promise to Abraham that God would make him into a great nation now has its foundations in the sons of Jacob. And we see in this section a number of pairs, a a number of, of doubles. There are two distinct people groups. There are two stone markers. There's a heap and there's a pillar. And these have two names, one in Hebrew and one in Aramaic. There's two ancestors that are mentioned, Abraham and Nahor. There's two meals, two invocations of God. As Moses was writing this, he set up the the pairs, so that we could see, as the readers, we could see that there are are two, 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 two. There's no longer one. There's two. So in response to Laban's offer, Jacob sets up a pillar. And Jacob then, after he set up the pillar, had his kinsmen gather stones and, and put them in a heap. This is something that we have seen in the Old Testament and will continue to see there's, there's markers, there's visible reminders of God's actions among his people. And so they set up the pillar, they set up the heap of stones, and they ate a meal together. This was a way that people then entered into covenants. It was the, the meal together. This was now a covenant that was agreed upon and confirmed by both parties. The word in Hebrew for heap is gal. And so Jacob named it galid. And the Aramaic word, again, is jagar sahadutha. Both of these mean a heap of witness. When you see this heap, you will remember what we entered into. It will serve as a reminder. Then Laban said in verse 48, this heap is a witness between you and me today. The Lord, Yahweh, watch between you and me. When we are out of one another's sight, if you oppress my daughters, although no one is with us, God is a witness between you and me. And so they also called it mitzpah, which means watchtower. It's a reminder that God is watching. But isn't it interesting that Laban used the the name Yahweh Jacob's God, not Laban's God. Laban was not a follower of Yahweh. Jacob was. And so so Laban is putting it on Jacob now. Yahweh will watch you. Your God, Jacob, will watch what you're doing. He knew that Jacob followed Yahweh. And so he used Jacob's God, not his own. Even though Jacob and Laban were going to separate Yahweh who appeared to Laban in a dream, would now be the judge. And so verse 51, Laban continued to use the heap as a boundary beyond which neither could pass. Now again, remember, Laban was given specific directions by God that he was not to enter into Jacob's area. So Laban had no ability, unless he wanted to completely disregard God's command, which he wouldn't have done, otherwise he, w- he would have paid the consequence. So really this is Laban's way of saying, Jacob, you can't come back. Jacob, you, you are not welcome back. This was solely a protection of Laban and his property, which then lends credence to the idea that we talked about last week that by possessing the household gods, Rachel could lay claim to Laban's property. This was done. Jacob, you can't come back here. I know that that somebody in your camp has my gods, and you can't use them to come back and take my stuff. Laban is protecting himself. In verse 53, Laban uses multiple deities. The God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, 
the God of their father, judge between us. This could probably be better translated, the God of Abraham, the gods of Nahor, the gods of their father. Remember, Nahor and Terah were both polytheists. The, the word Elohim, the, the plural word for God, is, is the God of Jacob, the God of Abraham, the God of the Old Testament. But it is also the same word that's used for pagan gods, multiple gods. And so, so Laban here is saying that the God of Abraham and the gods of Nahor and the gods of Terah will judge. He is, he is setting it out there. You, you've probably talked to people who all gods lead to the same place. All, all religions are the same. And so the, it doesn't matter which one you follow. Just as long as you follow one of them, it's all good. That's kind of Terah's perspective here. Of course, we know that there is one God. There is one God. All the rest are fake gods. None of the rest, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, do not all worship the same God. We know that Jesus is God. And if you reject Jesus as God, then you are not worshiping the same God. But Nahor, but Laban here is, he's just making sure he's safe. The God of Abraham, the gods of Nahor, the gods of Terah, all of them collectively will watch over you. But it's interesting. So then we get to verse 53, and Jacob doesn't bite. So Jacob swore by the fear of Isaac, his father. Laban, if there's any question on what God I am making a covenant with you under, if there's any question what, which God that you are claiming that I worship, it's the fear of Isaac. The God who appeared to you, Yahweh, the one true God. I am not going to swear by the gods of Nahor. I'm not going to swear by the gods of Terah. Because they are not gods. The only God I will make a covenant under is the fear of Isaac. Yahweh, the God who is the creator. There would be no confusion. He worshiped the God of his father. The God of Isaac. The God of Abraham. And it's by that God that Jacob would enter into a covenant. So Jacob offered a sacrifice, and he and his family ate, and this bound his family, his sons, to the same covenant. They could no longer return to Haran. They were no longer to go back. They could not now, as Jacob and Isaac did, go back to Nahor's family and find wives. The division between the two families was now complete. They are separate. Done. So early in the morning, Laban kissed and blessed his daughters and his grandchildren. Notice that he did nothing for Jacob, which is very different than when Jacob arrived in Haran and Laban ran out to meet him. Remember verse, or chapter 29, verse 13, as, as soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, he ran out to meet him, embraced him, and kissed him, and brought him into his house. These 20 years have created some not nice feelings between the two. And so Laban kissed his daughters and his grandchildren, ignored Jacob. The family of Nahor's place in Scripture ends here. They're done. No longer will we see Nahor's family as any involvement with the people of God. I want to spend a moment reflecting on the change in Jacob's life because this has been significant. When he left Canaan, it was because he had deceived his father. He lied about who he was. The birthright belonged to him, but he went about getting it the wrong way. Now, knowing the family, we see that Rebecca probably wasn't that much different than her brother. There's deception, there's 
a lack of trust, a lack of honesty. So Jacob fled to get away from Esau and to find a wife. It was supposed to be a short stay, but he was there for 20 years. And we will see that Rebekah has now already died. He arrived in Haran, broken, dejected, destitute, but he had the promise of El Shaddai, God who had appeared to him at Bethel. He had nothing to offer but his own abilities. He was a cunning man. Remember we saw that he was cut from the same cloth as Laban. They were almost one in the same. Jacob was like his mother who was like her brother. They could not be trusted. But over the 20 years in Haran, God did some amazing work in Jacob's heart and mind. Now God could have given Jacob everything immediately. God could have brought Jacob to Haran, given him everything that he needed, and then Jacob could have went back. But that's not what God was after. God was fixing the bigger issue, and the bigger issue was Jacob himself. We, I know that we have all experienced this. I've talked about this, and I've continued to do so because it's something that continues. God continues to remind me. We often think, God, you are a slow mover. God, will you please move a little bit faster? God, what are you doing? And the problem is we don't look in the mirror and see the actual problem. God is dealing with Jacob here. He didn't send Jacob to Haran to just give him wives and goods. He sent Jacob to Haran to change who Jacob was. There is nothing that really separated Jacob and Laban when Jacob arrived. But through being cheated and deceived, Jacob saw his own character. And God taught Jacob to trust him. Jacob was blessed even in difficult times. And God made Jacob prosperous while fulfilling the Abrahamic covenant and also cursing Laban in fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. Jacob had 11 sons and at least one daughter, along with material wealth in his 20 years, and the Abrahamic blessing was now in full effect. But the problem, the reason it took so long, was like me, Jacob is a very slow learner when it comes to his own depravity. And God had to break him. But when it was time to leave Haran, Jacob immediately obeyed. When pursued by Laban, God appeared to Laban. God was showing Jacob that he, he, God, God alone was trustworthy and could be trusted the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, was now the God of Jacob. It was a journey. There was, when he arrived, there was nothing that could have separated Jacob from Laban. There was nothing that anybody could have seen that would distinguish the two. The characters were one and the same. Left to our own devices, there is nothing that separates us as believers, as Christians, from the world. Sins they struggle with, we struggle with. Things that tempt them tempt us. When the world says Christians are not different, in one sense they are absolutely correct. But in another they are very wrong. Because we have seen Jacob's journey of sanctification. And we'll continue to see this journey because the journey never ends. Sanctification is a very difficult process. It forces us to come face to face with our own sin, our own depravity, our own pride, our own selfishness. Jacob and Laban were very similar when he arrived. They were very different when he left. It took 20 years. But he learned and he changed. God brought him face to face with himself and it changed him. This is what separates Christians from the world. The Christian sees his sin, confesses it, works in conjunction with the Holy Spirit to change. 
There is nothing that we can do in and of ourselves to change who we are. We must do it with the power and grace of God. When confronted by our sins, confess and repent. The idea of repent, there, there's two aspects to repent. One is to think differently. right? It's, it's change how you're thinking about things. The other is to change where you're going. It's a change of direction. You ever head one way and you think, oh, I got to go this way. That's, that's repentance. It's a mental thing, but it's also a physical thing. We do not have a pull yourself up by your own bootstraps faith. We can't. We are depraved. We are sinful. But we submit ourselves to God, to his word in our life. This is not easy. This is not for the faint of heart. It is not for the proud. It's for the broken. And God had to break Jacob and he has to break us. What separated Jacob and Laban after 20 years? It's the work of God in Jacob's life. Jacob surrendered to the Spirit of God. It's been a wonderful but still incomplete transformation. And we'll see him continue to grow and trust. The same is true for us until God calls us home. We are on a journey. His work in our lives is not yet complete. And so be patient with yourself, be patient with one another. God is working in us all. God is working to change our own hearts. Be gracious to one another, knowing that God is working. If somebody offends you, forgive. Have a conversation about it. Talk about it. And grow together. Repent and believe the gospel. Because it is the power of God for salvation to all who believe. It is the only thing that we have that we can learn from and rest in. And as we repent and believe the gospel, we do that through the power of God who calls us and causes us to change. And he works in our own hearts, in our own lives, and he makes us into his image. What a wonderful, terrible journey. But man, is it worth it.